This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And surprise! We are still on break, but I'm popping into your feed with a few updates, an old favorite, and just to say hi. So, hi! Let's go! Hi, everyone! It's July 2021, and I just wanted to pop into the feed to say howdy. I wanted to give some updates for some of our animal friends that we've talked about over the last 10 months, but as I lock myself back into the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, I'm realizing that maybe I shouldn't have put all of my dirty, gross shoes in my closet to fester without air since May. It's stinky in here, so this might be a very, very, very short update. (laughs) So anyway, I wanted to give some updates for some of our animal friends that we had talked about over the last 10 months of Bewilderbeasts, including Wally the Walrus. Do you guys remember him? Back in episode 31, Bears, Bees, Battlestar Galactica, we talked about how bees use twerking to murder murder hornets and literally coat their hives in poop to throw off, well, the scent for hornets that wanted to murder them. But also in that episode, we discussed a very special walrus who fell asleep on an iceberg and woke up in Ireland. Well, Wally, this very special walrus, has since traveled to Wales, Spain, France, and is basically backpacking like a college kid on a gap year. This is unusual for two reasons. One, walruses are not often spotted in warmer waters because, well, walrus. They prefer Arctic climes, and Wally is still a walrus. No one knows what's up with him. And the second thing is, well, also like a kid in college gap year, he's hitching rides on boats. He's not swimming. Here's a quote from the BBC. Mandy Williams, whose partner owns the boat Wally was sunbathing on, said that he had been there for several hours. It's a 28-foot fishing boat, and he's managed to climb in it. He's also sunk two boats this morning. One sunk and the other turned upside down. One of them was my partner's punt. He was hoping to go fishing later, but whether he can or not, I don't know. So we'll keep you posted on my favorite walrus story in the history of ever as news comes in, and if we ever find out if they get to go fishing later, I'll let you know. The other bit of news I wanted to provide an update on is our friend Magawa the rat. Do you remember him, the hero rat who sniffed out so many landmines he was given a teeny tiny rat-sized gold medal for his service? Well, according to NPR, he is retiring after five years on the job. In four years, he has helped clear more than 2.4 million square feet of land. In the process, he's found 71 landmines and 38 items of unexploded ordnance, which I, I guess is just fancy words for things that go boom and you don't want to touch them. He was also the very first rat in the 77 years of recognizing hero animals to receive this honor. And get this, he was trained with positive reinforcement. He literally worked for fruit. If he found the right scent, he earned a banana. Not only that, but here's a bit from the NPR article linked in the notes. Quote, we really trust our rats because very often after clearing a minefield, our teams play a game of soccer on the cleared field to assure the quality of our work. That's trust, y'all. The rats have freed more than one million people from the terror of living with unexploded bombs in their backyards, in their communities, and in their schoolyards. Like, these rats are doing amazing work for humanity. 
Once their skills wane, they do go to a rat retirement home where they get food and play for the rest of their days. And that's where Magawa is right now. To my understanding, you can quote, adopt Magawa. But that doesn't mean that he gets to come live with you. I gather it's more like naming a star after a loved one. You don't get to take the star home. For starters, it wouldn't fit. And it would probably kill you. But you pay money. And that star is registered in your name. I'm guessing it's pretty much the same thing for Magawa. The money you send to adopt him goes back into the program to help him live out his days and support his end-of-life care. This money helps keep this program going. And the hope is that Magawa's award will bring more attention to the cause in which Magawa and his human colleagues were devoted. Quote, we hope that we can solve the landmine problem in the next 5 to 10 years. But that needs engagement and the support of a wider public. And that's where we come in. You can go to the Apopo website and learn more about these rats that don't just sniff out these landmines. They also sniff out tuberculosis and save millions of lives every year. And I think if you can educate yourselves about these really cool animals doing these really cool things in parts of the world that you might not have a lot of exposure with, that's a very, very, very good thing. So those are the updates. If you have any other updates that I missed, maybe from firefighting goats or COVID detection animals, animals in science, or if you heard about a really cool animal doing a really cool animal thing, email bewilderbeespod at gmail.com. So now let's revisit a raven named Grip who not only inspired one author, but two. One was his owner, Charles Dickens, the guy forever tied to the Christmas spirit, or rather spirits. The other is Edgar Allan Poe, the granddaddy of Grimm. He was actually a legit twit. Great writer, but rather complicated. And he stole Charles Dickens' bird idea to create one of the most iconic poems in American history, The Raven. Quoth the Raven, nevermore. This is part of a famous poem by master of creepy Edgar Allan Poe. But this poem was inspired by another famous writer of the time's pet raven, Grip. Grip was owned by Charles Dickens. You might know him as the guy who wrote A Christmas Carol with Tiny Tim and Scrooge, and the talkative intelligent bird made an appearance in Charles Dickens' less known work, Barnaby Ridge. After reading the book as a literary critic, Edgar Allan Poe's critique of Charles Dickens' book, Barnaby Ridge, is that the bird wasn't used more. So, Edgar Allan Poe just took it. Edgar Allan Poe wrote the poem, The Raven, which featured a raven who knocks on the door of a man who is grieving after his beloved Lenore had died. The raven can talk, but only can say one word. Nevermore, which to me, reading the poem and imagining a man talking to a raven and watching him descend into madness and getting more and more frustrated that he can only say nevermore instead of, oh, holy cow, a talking bird in Baltimore? That does kind of make me giggle. People were not stupid, and they realized the poem that had become one of the most famous poems in history was essentially Edgar Allan Poe taking this concept from a book that he reviewed, from Mr. Christmas Miracle himself, Charles freaking Dickens. That takes some serious nutcrackers. People would just shout out to Poe on the street, Yo, the raven! or chant, because they could do some serious shade before TikTok was a thing, quote, Here comes Poe with his raven like Barnaby Rudge. Three-fifths of him genius, two-fifths sheer fudge. Essentially, this was old-timey insulting for, Hey, you're super smart, dude, but we know you totes stole this idea. And while he eventually became famous, and is widely considered to be the father of the American short story and all things mystery, macabre, dark, and spooky— He did not make money on his work in this lifetime. Edgar Allan Poe is frequently noted as the first American author to try to make his living with only writing. And not much has changed, really, since the 1800s. Most authors cannot survive on writing alone. Can relate. But for a man that we look back at and say, wow, that guy must have everything, he really didn't. 
Edgar Allan Poe was never really financially secure, and by all accounts, he really struggled despite writing as much as he did. I'm wondering if the ghost of Grip the Raven came back to get Poe, a la the grieving lover in The Raven. You see, the end of Edgar Allan Poe's life actually sounds a whole lot like one of the stories that he would have come up with. Edgar Allan Poe was found by a man named Joseph Walker, who brought Poe to the hospital in need of immediate assistance. Poe was found wandering deliriously on the streets of Baltimore. He certainly was not the last to do so. In a mystery fitting for Poe himself, he was wearing someone else's clothing, kept calling out the name Reynolds the night before his death, which I imagine in a nevermore manner. Doctors asking, how are you feeling? Reynolds! Whose clothes are these? Reynolds! Do you like Jello, Mr. Poe? Reynolds! And if you've seen Hamilton, you might have feelings about the name Reynolds. Ugh, that guy. He never became lucid enough to say exactly how he got in the state he was in, but he died days later at a hospital. After Edgar Allan Poe died, all of his medical records and his death certificate just up and disappeared. It's theorized that Poe died either of alcoholism, which at the time they would have called it cerebral inflammation or congestion of the brain, epilepsy, cholera, rabies, don't pet wildlife kids, or syphilis, which according to Ranker.com, this beast of a bacteria, syphilis, has taken out other historical figures too, like Christopher Columbus, who brought it to the New World and killed millions of native people who were not able to fight the bacteria. Noted gangster Al Capone killed upwards of 400 people, either directly or indirectly, and he was felled by advanced syphilis while at Alcatraz prison. Oscar Wilde, another writer who very likely had syphilis, but also had died from the treatment. Mercury, of which he had so many mercury treatments, his teeth famously turned black and he covered his mouth any time he spoke. Oh, and good old Honest Abe, President Lincoln himself, was not unfamiliar with traveling the country to see the sights and meet some new friends. Very likely passed this disease on to his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, who in her last days famously descended into what they called hysteria, which is honestly just code for woman who wasn't behaving in a socially ladylike manner, and that could span quite a spread of behaviors, including things like wanting to vote or saying no to your husband. By all accounts, most women of today would be considered hysterical. <coughs> However, her hysteria was well documented, and while it's often suggested that she started to go downhill after her husband was brutally murdered by gunshot while they were at the theater while she sat next to him, which would absolutely make anyone need to seek out some psychological assistance, what makes experts consider syphilis was the knife-like pain in her back, dementia, impaired coordination, blindness, and weight loss. All of these are symptoms of advanced syphilis, which President Lincoln, had he not been shot in the skull, might have suffered from as well. And since only his brain was autopsied, because, you know, it was the 1800s and it was pretty clear that that was the cause of his death, they never looked anywhere else in his body. So it's unclear if the syphilis had progressed as he had admitted to contracting the disease in 1835 to his law partner at the time. But at the time, 15% of everyone had syphilis. It was basically as American as apple pie. So when you're the granddaddy of Grimm and your death certificate ends up missing, it certainly adds to the entire aura of how people think about you going forward. So let's go back to Grip. Grip the raven, preserved with arsenic, which we know is a poison, but at the time was used for everything. A preservation chemical for dead animals. Does a medicine to treat skin blemishes, pimples, moles, ulcers, and <gasps> syphilis. That's some circle of life stuff right there, kids. It was also a preferred murder weapon by spiking coffee with it or putting it in food as it's odorless and tasteless. And now, after searching for all of this, I'm confident I am on a list. So if next week's episode doesn't drop on time, now you know why. Who knows, maybe Poe had contracted syphilis and tried to do some self-treatment and just overdid it. Or he had other things going on. I'm certainly not going to armchair quarterback his death. People have been trying for nearly 175 years. I'm confident there is a Reddit for this if you want to go to Wacky Theory Town. But back to Grip. 
Grip the Raven died in 1841, and according to his owner Charles Dickens, remember that guy? Apparently Grip had some famous last words glorified and probably exaggerated by Dickens himself. Quote, On the clock striking twelve, he exclaimed, Hello, old girl, his favorite expression, and died. Making me wonder if Grip was the original Hollaback Girl. And when he did, Charles Dickens had him stuffed, preserved with arsenic, again, poison, and mounted into a shadow box that you can still see today. Colonel Richard Gimble purchased the ex-raven who had ceased to live at an auction as he was a huge fan of all things Poe. And here's the thing that gets me. Poe never even owned this bird and probably never even met the thing. And it's so connected to Edgar Allan Poe despite being Charles Dickens' bird. And Dickens gets the shaft again. In 1971, Colonel Gimble's collection of all things Edgar Allan Poe and the smaller collection of all things Poe that were once actually Charles Dickens was donated to the Free Library in Philadelphia where Grip is just chilling out in the rare book department on the third floor. Gimble was a serious collector, despite my jokes here. You can see the only known copy of The Raven and the first edition copies of all of Edgar Allan Poe's works in Philadelphia. Grip the Raven, who inspired the famous poem The Raven, has inspired other works too, including the name of the NFL football team, The Baltimore Ravens, after Edgar Allan Poe, who was buried there. An episode of The Simpsons, which now you know you've made it. Several gothic rock bands. An episode of Mama's Family. An episode of Alton Eats. A cooking show where a plastic chicken replaced the famous raven, and instead of saying, nevermore, he repetitively states, fry some more. And my absolute favorite, quoth the raven. Get it? The bird is named Quoth, and he's a raven, in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. So if you go see Grip, just don't touch the bird. Seriously, it's poison and a relic and stuff, but it might totally kill you. Which is, honestly, probably what Poe wanted. So that's it. Thanks for joining me for these updates and on this shorty. If there are trips down memory lane that you'd like me to revisit for the rest of the summer, let me know and I'll pop it up as a standalone in the feed. And remember, regular weekly episodes will start back up after Labor Day. All episodes can be found at BewilderBeastPod.com, BewilderBeast on Instagram, and BewilderBeastPod on Facebook. Oh, Twitter. Sorry, BewilderBeastPod. I'm out of practice, y'all. Talk to me, send notes, DMs, ideas, all of it at any of the above or email BewilderBeastPod at gmail.com. Want a sticker? I'll send you a sticker. DM your Addy and I'll send one right to you, happily. Updates for Wally the Wandering Walrus provided by BBC and Magawa the Retired Rat by NPR. Sources for Edgar Allan, oh no, can be found on the show notes of episode 20, quote, The Raven Baltimore, which also features San Francisco Airport's first therapy pig and, I forgot this, Mike the Headless Chicken. Look him up. That episode is so much fun. So that's it for now. Stay curious and I will see you sometime this summer. Bye-bye.